Good morning. Uh, can, can I ask you this? You, you brought Lance Black in from Florida to represent you. Why? Why? So we can get some answers. Okay. Lance, I'm going to bring you into this conversation. I had an opportunity to meet you a couple days ago. The, the, the premise of your press conference upstairs was? Well, it's been almost two years uh, since uh, Andrew went missing, and then two months later his body was found, and yet Tammy and John have no answers. And, you know, more importantly, there's just been a total lack of communication, concern, uh, however you want to describe it, in terms of law enforcement, particularly the Minnesota Bureau, uh, being in communication with this family and giving them updates. Uh, so far, just nothing seems to be happening. So, and, and there is an inherent conflict here. When you have law enforcement investigating law enforcement, there's always a potential problem. And here you've got the Drug Task Force Agency, which is partly in Minnesota and partly in the Wapaton Southeast Talking area. Talking about Semka here. Semka, exactly. Yeah. So um, it's just time. You know, when you, when you add up all the circumstances and the factors here, it's time for a fresh set of eyes to look at this investigation. And the FBI doesn't have the same type of conflict that these other agencies may have. So you, at your press conference just now, called for the FBI to step in and investigate this crime. That's right. And and here here's the part that, Tammy, it, it was so frustrating for you and I. Yes. We tried to bring this attention to everyone's attention before, and everywhere we went, they kept deflecting. They kept saying to us, well, that's not ours. This is open. We can't discuss that. Nobody would take the lead. No one we could talk to would say, this is on my desk. The buck stops here. I'm going to get to the bottom of this. And that was what was so frustrating for us, Tammy. Remember that? Yes, frustrating is a mild word. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> and, 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 and so, Lance, really what you're doing is saying, look, somebody's got to come in and referee and take the lead on this. Yeah, I mean, I haven't been involved in the case that long. Um, and But I've been able to backtrack and see the efforts that Tammy and John have gone to to contribute to the investigation. And um, over that year and a half long period, there's been one meeting at their home, right? And there's been uh, no telephone calls, none, to update them on the progress or lack thereof of the investigation. And then the last email that Tammy got concerning an update on the investigation was in September of 2015. <laughs> And then when I got on board, I, I contacted the Minnesota Bureau, since they're the lead agency. Because Andrew's body was found on the Minnesota side. Right, right. And um, I was told that, well, you need to talk to my supervisor by the lead investigator. So I go to the supervisor, and she says, well, put your questions in writing. So I put the questions in writing, and they were handed out today as part of the press packet, and I never got responses to my written questions. And then it was, well, we'll meet with Tammy and John, and if they want you there, that's fine. Uh, but we can't meet with you the week that you're up here from Florida because we've got training. Well, I know that the training was three nights this week and not during the week itself. So they obviously didn't want to see me. And um, that just even further strengthens, in my opinion, the need to – do what needs to be done, and that is get somebody else to investigate this murder. Well, and, and that's, I think, why one of the smarter things you did was also enlist local help here. But, Tim O'Keefe is now part of this legal team that's going to be investigating this. Tim, you've got all these jurisdictional issues. You've got SEMCA, which represents not just North Dakota, but Minnesota. Right. Uh, you've got a body found in Minnesota. When you talk to people at SEMCA, nobody says who's in charge of SEMCA. Do you realize the mountain that you're about ready to climb here? We do, and we, and we have three goals here with the SADX. Being local, we can help them with the legislation. You know, we want to we want to get to that at some point. Uh, we can help them try and hold people accountable. But the the third thing and the most important right now is to to get some answers. And it it's a mountain, and we don't want to step on law enforcement's toes. You know, we know a lot of these people here working here locally. My law partner that's with me, uh, Tatum O'Brien, does a lot of criminal defense work in the area. She has a lot of clients that are asked to be CIs. It's a very important program to them, yet they don't want to, to, to tell us anything. They don't want to give us any information that will help this family. 
And we can't go out on our own and do it because then we'll be accused of tampering with their evidence, which we don't want to do. But we want to be here locally for Tammy and John at this point to just get something going. And we don't know how the FBI will respond or the Department of Justice, but we're optimistic that they'll see what's going on, that there's been a lack of communication, a lack of information, a lack of progress. This family has a right to start the grieving process, and how can they do that if they don't know the answers to their questions, no matter what those answers might be? Tammy, I have to ask you this, and John, I apologize for the direct bluntness to that. Has anyone told you yet, any official once told you that is involved with this, whether or not they believe that this was a murder or a suicide? Right in the very beginning, we were told that it was a suicide. And who told you that? Sergeant Helgenson. Okay, and he was the lead investigator from the State College of Science, right. who the they put the lead police. on this, with, yeah. which all due respect to the campus police, uh, you know, they've got a job to do, and it is not investigating a potential murder. Exactly. And Lance, when you look at this, what do you believe this is? Well, I mean, <clears throat> every case has its own set of facts, but, you know, in my heart, I believe that Andrew was doing very dangerous work, um, that a target was, um, that is a, a drug target, somebody he was trying to buy drugs from in order to do his service, um, found out what he was doing. And there's a saying in the drug world, a dead snitch can't snitch. And I think Andrew paid the ultimate price for it. You and I had a visit the other day, and it stuck with me because – Tammy and I have had this very same conversation. You, you sit there, and if Andrew had been my son and he had gone into law enforcement and he had come to me and said, D you know, Dad, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go into undercover uh, work in, in the drug field. I'm going to try to find individuals uh, undercover as a trained law enforcement officer. Every night I'd go to my knees and I'd pray for his safety. Yeah. They put him out there on the front line trying to do that work without any training whatsoever with law enforcement. Uh, it, it, they put it without any backup. They put a target on his back. Yeah, it's the most dangerous type of police work there is. And we don't use we don't use college kids who get in a little trouble to write parking tickets or direct traffic at the football game. How do we how can we justify using a college kid like Andrew, 20 years old, out doing the most dangerous type of police work, going undercover, wearing a wire, involved in the drug trade, which is highly dangerous when you start trying to snitch on somebody. And so it's, and the, and the one thing that I've noticed in comparison to the other states that I've handled these cases is there is <clears throat> a real lack, there appears to be a real lack of supervision here. Um, and I think it's because every, nobody, nobody wants to put themselves in front of this. Well, I, I in terms of the case managers, um, you know, Andrew's case manager at Simca basically said, go out and find us some people and uh, and then let us know when you're ready to do the deal. And there's no documentation in his CI packet as to who he was meeting and when he was meeting. So there's really no control here. And it's basically go out and create some crime. <laughs> You know, instead of law enforcement solving crime, in this situation, they're out creating crime. And that's what they're basically sending him out to do. J John Sadik, I'm going to ask you a question if you don't mind. Is that okay with you? I mean, you, other than can I talk to Tammy, that's the only time <laughs> you and I have talked so far in this process. The, the hook for them here, for, for the people that put Andrew in, in real harm's way, the hook for them is that the Andrews of the world don't want to drive up that driveway Look you in the eye and say, Dad, I got caught smoking some pot and selling a $40 bag of weed. They don't want to do that because they respect you and they love you so much and they don't want you to think less of them. How frustrating is it to you to know that, that your son was put in a position where he was signing documents based on the fact that he couldn't go talk to his own father? It was unbelievable, for one thing. I couldn't believe that somebody could actually force you not to tell your parents that you're in trouble <laughs> or bully you into that. Had he done that, had he come home and said, dad, this is, this is the hand I've dealt myself. I'm in some trouble here. What would he have done to him? What would have you said? Well, first I'd have scolded him, of course, but uh, I would have uh, worked with him with whatever we needed to get done 
to remedy the situation. What have you told him to go down the route that they placed him in? No. Tammy, what Absolutely. have you said? What have you said? Look, we can get this off your record. We could get this cleared. Go out and make three drug buys. Tell them who you bought it from, and let's just get it off your record. Would have that been the advice you gave to him? Because Absolutely they were not. They were t- they were threatening no thirty way. to forty years in jail for, to him. Right, right. But do they actually serve that? N- no. 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 Joel, and there's they... no parent in the world that would have done that. <laughs> no. it, Andrew was. In all likelihood, had he gone home and told his parents and maybe hired an attorney or not even hired an attorney, this kid was not going to prison. He had no criminal record. He might have had one speeding ticket, I think Tammy told me. Yeah. Uh, the, we see these crimes all the time. And we're not justifying that somebody breaks the law, but they don't need to be told that they're going to spend 40 years in prison when in all likelihood they're probably going to have to serve some kind of supervised probation, maybe pay a fine. And you know what? If if they have an issue with drugs and they need help, let's get them help. That's right. Let's not throw that's them exactly in prison. That's exactly right. Well, yeah. and, and, and that's the hook, though. The hook is that the person he's most afraid to go home and embarrassed to say that are sitting right here. Absolutely. And, and so by having that over him, it, just the sheer embarrassment of saying, Dad, I got caught smoking pot and selling a $40 bag of weed. Then the next bag they set up after they got him, they make sure it's close enough to the school so now they can advance the charges, Tammy. Correct? Right. That's correct. Actually, both of them were on campus. Right. I mean, so Lance, and in, in, in because this isn't your first rodeo, I mean, you've done this before. You, you've you been successful. I know why the Saddicks have brought you up here. I saw the 60 Minutes piece. This isn't just North Dakota and Minnesota, is it? Oh, no. Heavens, no. Um, no, it's Florida. Uh, I've got cases in uh, West Virginia, Arizona, Massachusetts. Um, I get calls weekly from people who are in trouble, who are being coerced into doing this. And, you know, there's certain common patterns. Um, but in talking to uh, Tatum O'Brien, who's with us and who's a criminal defense lawyer here in um, North Dakota, uh, it just sounds like the program here using CIs is, is on steroids. Uh, and the only, th- I mean, I do know that uh, what, what's, what's the driving force behind using civilians to do undercover work? And remember, we're only using civilians to do undercover work in drug-related cases. We're not having them go out and investigate or be a part of murders or robberies or thefts. Why drugs? Well, because we have billions of dollars appropriated by the government, federal government, in drug war funds. And law enforcement agencies across the country are lining up, raising their hands for that money. Then you have state and local funding for drug war money. And um, in order to justify the funding, you need to have arrest numbers. And the arrest numbers are what drives the use of civilians. That, that's what motivates law enforcement to use civilians to do their work. And that's where the real problem lies. And that's I see everywhere. And here you've got a state with 720,000 people. you got to turn a lot of numbers. You know, you got to recruit a lot of people in order to get your numbers up to justify the funding. Tim and Tatum, stick around. i gotta, I got a couple jurisdictional questions that I think the listening audience all over the upper Midwest is going to want to hear. They're going to want to hear from you how you're going to break down the jurisdictional issues. That This whole, it's not me, talk to him, it's not them. So pretty soon you guys are running around in a circle. And to me, that's the expertise that you're going to need to bring to all of this. I'm going to head to a break when we come back. More on the case of Andrew Sadik and the call for an FBI investigation right after this.